Good morning, church. We're glad you're here in house worshiping today, and we welcome those who are watching online. Hey, yesterday afternoon here in the sanctuary, we had the installation service of our new bishop, uh, and uh, his wife was here for the first time too. What a great day. And I was so proud of our church. I, I cannot, I don't know that you know how great this church is, but we, our choir loft was filled with a choir. They had to sit up there for two hours <laughs> before they got to sing. We had all, my, <clears throat> all the ushers were working and welcoming people. <clears throat> Andy was in charge of the place. I mean, he had people moving in every direction. <clears throat> and <clears throat> our, uh, our people in the kitchen fixed a, a wonderful meal for all the dignitaries. And then we had this lovely reception following it for the bishop and his wife. I'm, and the custodial staff. I mean, they must have been here at least till midnight last night working. But you would have been so pleased with the turnout. And many of the lay people of the church came for that very uh, uh, significant service. So I want to thank everybody that did anything, but particularly Matthew, who played the organ for it, of course. What a great organist he is. I, I just love hearing him. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, so, uh, but w this is the fifth Sunday of the month, which is a special time when we remember the children's home. And we have a, a video that we'd like for you to see at this time. Hello, um, I'm Cyrus, Cyrus Bumpers. I've lived at the children's home for about four years and one month. When I first got here, I was very quiet. It was a little, a little scary at first. My biggest struggle at the children's home was accepting that my, my parents and family would not join with me after my time here and that I would have to go to the future without them. With the spiritual life here, I experienced a lot of things not everyone gets to experience, and it changed my perspective in a good way, and I, I'm very grateful for it. At the school, it can be difficult. I got a lot very frustrated starting with the work because I didn't have a good education before I started, so it was very different for me. Now I've, I've, I've gotten student of the month, I've gotten on roll, I am thinking through about college or trade school. I haven't decided yet. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. It's a big day. I get to go to my forever home for good. Uh, I'm very, very, very happy. What I think I, I have learned is that things are gonna get hard. They always will. There will always be something to get hard, but then there's always something good that can come out of it. Thanks to you, the kids just like me have been able to find a forever home. I just want to say thank you. So you can find more announcements, more information, more ways to get connected in your bulletin, including how to register your attendance to let you know, uh, let us know that you are with us, submit any prayer requests. There is a nice QR code in there you can use or go to firstumc.org slash connect. Or if you would prefer to register the old fashioned way, don't worry, we have a little booklet out in the narthex. You can register your attendance that way. We also want to take an opportunity this morning to lift up those families that we want to continue to hold in prayer as they are grieving the loss of loved ones, and we as their church family want to hold them in prayer at this time. Please pray for the family of Stacy Reforgier and um, following the death of Stacy's mother, Linda Fussell, who passed away in Georgia on January 23rd. 
We'd also like to ask you to pray for the family of Howard Fitzgerald, who passed away on also on January 23rd at the age of 91. His life will be celebrated here tomorrow, January 30th at 1 p.m. in our chapel. We also would like to ask you to be in prayer for the family of a retired elder, the Reverend Doug Zipperer, former associate pastor of this church, who died on Thursday, January 26th. While we don't have a photo of him, many of you may remember him from the time that he served this church. He is survived by his wife, Suzanne, and their adult children, Angela, Jason, and Andy. And so we would like to ask you to be in prayer for their family at this time. And finally, we'd like to ask you to hold Marilyn Christ and the rest of her family in your prayers. We learned just yesterday that her brother, Jim Hawthorne, died on Thursday of this week. Now, will you join with me in prayer for these families in their time of grief? Gracious God, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for that guiding light, for that comfort, that, that hope that you bring to us in our time of grief. We thank you for the lives of these people that we have just read, God, the gift that it was for these people to know them, God. And so we pray that you would be near to these families, God, in their grief. Bring them comfort. Bring them hope of new life in Christ, God. And may you equip us, God, to be those comforters, to be those carers, to be the church family to these people in their time of grief. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Now, friends, let us join our hearts and minds together as we worship our God.
Several of us these last few days have continued to talk amongst each other and comment on how beautiful this space is with all the new lights. Perhaps you've uh, noticed that this morning, uh, whether here in person or even those uh, worshiping with us online. Um, it's still the same space, but it just looks different. And perhaps it is a way for us to remember how it is that we may experience God in a new way, uh, whether we expect it or not, sometimes uh, just out of the blue. And it is not that God has changed, it's just that our vision and our experience has changed. And this is something that we hope for each and every time we come together in worship, and certainly as we begin a new week. We see the God who is eternal, but perhaps in new ways, with new eyes and new experiences. And so as we have gathered together in worship, we worship God who is always changing from our point of view, even though God remains the same. And so in this hope and in this time of worship, I invite us to stand now as we are able, as we participate in the call to worship together. For happy are we when our treasures cannot be quantified. Happy are we when our knowledge is tempered by mystery. Happy are we when our pain is held in the balm of love. Happy are we when our delight comes from beyond ourselves. Our first hymn this morning will be, Be Thou My Vision.
Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we are able, as we continue together in voice and in spirit, our affirmation of faith. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. may be seated. So as we come to this time of prayer, we know that we bring all that we are into this worship space, whether we worship online or whether we worship in person this day. We bring our joys from our, the week, our sorrows from the week, and that we can bring that all to God in this time of prayer. So at this time, will you join together with me in prayer? Let us pray together. God of grace, God of glory, God of love, we thank you for this gift of gathering together in worship, whether we find ourselves in person today or whether we are worshiping online. May we be encouraged this day in this gift of Christian community, to be growing in our love of God, growing in our acts of justice, and growing in our acts of mercy. May we grow to be more like you, following in your great commands of loving God and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Our hearts are heavy this week, O oh Lord when we think of the harm, the violence, the injustice we see in our world and across our country. We pray for the victims of the Half Moon Bay shooting and other acts of violence in our nation this week. Our hearts break as we ache for an end to these injustices, O oh Lord. We pray for change and may we be people who work for change. May we, O oh Lord, learn to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. We pray all this in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. And so as we come to this time of offering, we know that we give back to God, not out of guilt, not out of obligation, but out of that great gratitude for all that God has first given to us and out of that response of grace, seeking to be generous people, seeking to see what our generosity when combined together can go to make a difference in the world. And so on this Children's Home Sunday, we are reminded what our giving does to make a difference in the lives of children. We saw firsthand what the Florida United Methodist Children's Home does to transform the lives of children through that ministry. But we have many ministries within the walls of our church that are changing the lives of children too. Our Neighborhood Ministries program ministers to families right here in our community with nearly 100 students every week who we see Monday through Friday where they have the opportunity to have a space where they can be tutored from school, they can learn that God loves them, and they can learn that this church loves them too. And that's not to mention our regular children's programming and all the other wonderful things we do to invest in the lives of our children in our community as an extension of God's love for them and our love as a church for them. So may we take this time with grateful and mission-minded hearts to give back to our God together.
seated, why don't you turn and greet one another in the spirit and in the love of Christ. Thank you very much. All right. I do want to uh, say to those of you that are visiting with us this morning how pleased we are that you've come to be a part of our worship experience. And um, I just uh, hope you'll feel free to come back and worship with us often uh, because it's a great place, a great church. That music, I just told her, that soothed the savage beast within me. I, I, I needed to hear that this morning. And uh, so it was a real blessing. And uh, I think that's what worship is all about. And by the way, to those of you that are watching us online, we really miss you. And I miss shaking hands with you. I miss uh, hugging you. We're almost to the point where we can hug again, aren't we? And how we need that. We need each other we need to gather in with each other as a family so uh, come on back and worship with us we we would love to see us uh, being together that way the scripture reading this morning is out of the sixth chapter of Micah I'm just reading just one the the last verse the eighth verse and I'm reading out of the new international version Micah has this to say to us he, he climbs the ladder of faith. He's a, an Old Testament prophet. And as a prophet can, he climbs the ladder of faith and he looks into the face of God. And God speaks to him and he comes back and he writes a note to us. And I want to unfold the note and read what he has to say that he came back with a message from God. He says this, he has shown you O oh, mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to practice kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. How good it is, O oh Lord, to draw away from the kind of world that we live in and just to be still and to know that you are God. How good it is to gather with friends, strangers alike, to wait upon your Holy Spirit to come and bless us. How good it is to be fed by your word. And I pray that your spirit will fall afresh upon me and upon us we may be able to hear what you have to say, what the Spirit has to say to the church. So we wait for you. So come and speak to us, Lord, and bless us, because we need you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Some years ago, I was uh, 
in a training session for disciple Bible study in Dallas, Texas. Um, and part of this uh, was that we sat together at round tables and there were eight people each, at each table. The table I sat in, were, we were all preachers. I was the only one that wasn't from Texas. And I noticed that they all had on cowboy boots and big belts and that they had hung their cowboy hats on a rack that was in the room. So I was the only one that wasn't a cowboy either. And uh, we not only sat at the table for the training sessions, but we ate at the table as well. Well, uh, when they came to serve lunch, I said, I, I, guys, I got to tell you something. I told my wife, I'm going to Texas and I'm going to eat some cowboy food while I'm out there. I can't wait to eat some cowboy food. So bring on the grub. Let's eat. And they brought out quiche. <laughs> well, I'd always thought that real cowboys and real men didn't eat quiche. So I sat back. I wasn't about to eat mine until they ate theirs, but they ate every bit of it, never said a word. They, you know, people in Texas don't talk a whole lot. They didn't say a word. They just sat there and ate every bit of it. Well, that night at supper, I said, well, I was hoping to have some cowboy food this morning at noon today, but we had that quiche and it was pretty good, but tonight I'm gonna have some cowboy food. I had a fork in one end, a knife in the other. I said, bring out, bring out one of those big old steaks and a big Texas-sized baked potato. Whew, man, we're going to eat some good cowboy food. They brought out chicken breast a la Delta Airlines and <laughs> pressed and some of those mashed potatoes that looked like ice cream and, and green beans that when you ate them, they crunched. And I said, well, they didn't have cowboy food, but they're going to have cowboy dessert. I said, we're going to have a big old slab of pecan pie. And they brought out chocolate mousse. <laughs> well, one of the guys said to me after dinner, his family talked to me. He said, I'm tired of hearing you talk about cowboy food. So he said, I'm going to take you for lunch tomorrow to a Texas barbecue I know about here in town. I said, you drive, I'll buy. So we went to this Texas barbecue and he loaded my plate up with Mexican chili beans. <laughs> I took one bite and said, bring on the quiche. <laughs> but I learned something there. Real cowboys eat quiche, but real cowboys cry too when they eat Tex when they eat Mexican chili beans. I mean, it causes you to cry. But you know, there's another thing about real men that I discovered. Somewhere along the line, real men will not ask for directions. Even though they're lost, even though we get lost beyond imagination, we will not ask somebody for directions. Most of us don't anyway. That's why God invented, had invented the GPS because he gave up on us ever willing to ask for directions. But also one thing I've noticed about men as well is that when we're doing a do-it-yourself job, we won't read the directions for that either. And we usually mess up. We get lost when we don't ask for directions. We mess up when we don't read directions. And somebody has ably said that when all else fails, read the directions. Well, we've gotten some directions from Micah about what is a faithful person. How does a faithful person live? Here he comes with a word of direction. What does the Lord require of you? That's pretty, pretty direct. But to do justly, practice kindness, and walk humbly with your God. 
Well, now doing justly has something to do with doing what is right instead of what's wrong. And uh, it has something to do with playing by the rules. And in the owner's manual, we have some directions about that. They're called the Ten Commandments. They're given to us not because God needs them. It's because I need them and you need them. It's, it, they're given to us so that your life might have order. And if you want disorder in your life, don't pay any attention to the Ten Commandments. You want to mess up your home, your life, your family? Just leave God out of your life. Just walk as you want to in any old way in life. It's easy to walk, to go downhill and downstream. You want to mess up your life? Steal. If you want to mess up your life, lie. You want to mess up your life? Lust after something you can't have. You want to mess up your life? Commit adultery. It'll do it every time. Every time. You want to mess up your life? Kill somebody. Maybe that's the greatest gun law we could have in the United States of America. Thou shalt not kill. We live when we mess, we mess up when we don't live by the rules. And Jesus gives us some more rules. He tells us, love one another. That's a commandment. He tells us to, to turn the other cheek. He tells us to love our enemy, to pray for our enemy, to pray for those who would spitefully use you. That has something to do with righteousness, with doing what's right. If we obey the rules that are in the owner's manual. And then there's some th has something to do with not doing. That also has to do with doing what is just and what is right. Jesus said, hey, hey you, hey you, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. Oh, when did we see you hungry and didn't feed you? When did we see you naked and didn't clothe you? When did we see you in prison and didn't visit you? Oh, is you didn't do it? To the least of these, you didn't do it unto me. Oh yeah, the owner's manual says to us, if you want to have life as it ought to be, do what's right instead of what's wrong. But then it says practice kindness. The kind of world we live in is filled with so much anger. So I've never seen it this way before. Maybe I've lived too long because I've never seen it like this. And it breaks my heart to see the anger, the hatred, the prejudice, the bitterness in the church of all places. Not just in the world, it's in our neighborhood, but it's seeped into the church. We call people by names, we finger point, we judge people. And Jesus tells us, just love one another as I've loved you. Huh. Huh. My mother used to say as I'd go out the door, mind your manners. Your mother probably said the same thing. I know your mom. I bet she did. Did she say that? Okay. Sure she did. You know what that says? What minding your manners is, just be nice. Just be kind to one another. I don't know anybody that feels good because they're filled full of hatred. I don't know anybody that feels good because they're angry. You want to get rid of it? Give it over to Jesus. 
and begin to practice kindness with each other. Hey, what a good word of direction it is for us. The owner's manual says it for us. Practice kindness. Then the owner's manual says, uh, walk humbly with God. And I love that word of direction. Be faithful. Practice your holy habits. Talk with Jesus every day. And listen to Jesus every day. He wants to do that with you. He wants to have that friendship with you. That's called being faithful. A faithful friend. Walk faithfully with your God. When I first started out in the ministry, uh, my first full-time church was in Knoxville, Tennessee. And the first week I was there, I wanted to look nice for my first Sunday, so I decided I better get a haircut. So I went down into the little village near my church and saw a barbershop, walked in. There were three chairs. Uh, two people were being, having their hair cut, one of them. In the chair closest to the door, there was this tall, thin uh, young man sitting there, black hair. And he had on one of those aprons like a, like a barber has, had a comb in his pocket. And he was sitting, at, lounged in the, in the chair, the barber's chair. And I said to him, are you a barber? He said, yeah. Would you like to have your hair cut? I said, well, that's what I'm here for. He said, well, have a seat. They put that apron on me. And so I told him, I said, you know, uh, I got to tell you, I'm, my name's Riley Short. He said, my name's Glenn. I said, well, Glenn, is, I'm glad to meet you. He said, I said, I'm really excited. I said, I'm a I'm a brand new preacher starting in my very first church. I never had a, I had a student appointment, but this is the first full-time church. I'm a pastor of this little church up on the hill down the road, and uh, I'm really excited about starting out. He said, we got a lot in common. I said, really? He said, yeah, you're my first haircut. <laughs> I said, the first haircut today? <laughs> he said, no. Nope. My first haircut. So I swallowed my bubble gum and said, have a go. And Glenn would be my barber for the next five years. <clears throat> we played basketball together. We were on the same softball team together. We would have picnics with our children. He was a member of the Baptist church, but I said, God loves the Baptists and forgives them. And we had a wonderful friendship for all those years. One day when he was cutting my hair, I said, Glenn, what do you really want in life anyway? What are you really living for? And he seemed to be ready for an answer. He said, I want to own my own barbershop. I want to see my children grown to maturity. And I want to get my quartet. He had a quartet in the Baptist church that he led. I want to get my quartet on television every week. I said, man, that's great. That's great, Glenn. Those are good things. And he looked at me and he said, what do you want? What do you really want in life, right? And I said, you know, Glenn, I don't want stuff. I really don't. I just want to be faithful. And he said, well, that's great. That's great. Fast forward 45 years. 45 years, I'm at a meeting in Lake Jaluska. And a young preacher comes up to me. And he said, uh, Riley Short? And I said, yeah, it's me. 
He said, uh, he gave me his name and he said, I'm the associate pastor at Fountain City Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I said, I used to live there. He said, oh yeah, I know that. He said, I, I get my hair cut by a guy named Glenn. And he asked me if I knew you. I said, well, I don't know him personally, but I know who he is. And he said, have you ever seen him? Tell him I own my own barbershop. Well, Knoxville is not that far from June Luska. So I decided I was going to go check in on Glenn and his barbershop. I drove down Broadway and I saw a sign that said Glenn's barbershop. I had on a baseball hat and dark gloves and bib overalls and I was driving a pickup truck. I mean, I was really feeling good about being in East Tennessee right then. I walked in the barbershop and it was packed. People, men sitting all along the wall, had three chairs and all three chairs had people in them and barbers. Well, I of course recognized, I recognized Glenn, he was in the third chair back. So I walked up to him and stood there and looked at him. I said, do you own this barbershop? And there was a silence that fell over the whole place. Because it sounded rough, you know. And he, he said, well, yes, sir, I do. I said, Is there a problem? I said, no, he didn't recognize me. I said, no, there, there's no problem. I just want to know if you own this shop or not. He said, well, I do. He still didn't recognize me, so I said, well, do you give manicures? <laughs> there isn't a barbershop in East Tennessee that gives manicures. And this time, I get a lot of looks from the people that are sitting over there. And Glenn said, not if I can help him. <laughs> he still didn't recognize me. So then I said, well, do you give special rates for Methodist preachers. And he said, Riley, Riley. And we hugged unashamedly. Those guys really got to look at me. <laughs> but he stepped back and he said, I own my own barbershop. My children have grown to maturity my quartets on TV every week. And he looked at me and he said, what about you, Riley? Have you been faithful? And I said, Glenn, he's still working on me. It's a process. And that's what I want to be still, just faithful. When you mess up in life, when everything goes wrong, read the directions. They're right there on how you can find life at its best. What is it that you really want in life anyway? What is it that you're living for? Micah gives us some good directions. Do what's right. Practice kindness. Walk humbly with God. When you follow the instructions, you find life at its best. And that's the truth. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is number 452. My faith looks up to you to the we'll sing the verses of that song
now may the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you and keep you in his peace, grace, and glory now and forever and forever and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.